Hello Advanced Chem students and welcome to our first online video talking about chemical kinetics. As we introduced in class uh, earlier in the week, kinetics can really be broken down into uh, deriving two types of laws, two types of rate laws. There's the differential rate law and then there's the integrated rate law. What we're going to focus in on in this video is the first type, the differential rate law. What the differential rate law is going to allow us to do is it's going to tell us how the speed of our reaction is dependent upon things like the concentration of our reactants and temperature. Now, the first of these, the concentration one, we're going to see that overtly through the course of this video. We're going to see a clear connection between how the rate is determined and the concentration of the reactants. Buried inside of this differential rate law is going to be the effect of temperature, and we'll get to that in more detail uh, later on in the trimester. Um, but know that temperature is also part of this particular rate law. Later on, also, um, uh, later on in, in February, we'll talk about the integrated rate law, which is going to connect concentration with the issue of time. So we'll be able to answer with integrated rate law the question of how much reagent will I have after five minutes of the reaction, after five days, after five years? How will the concentration change over time? With the differential rate law, we're going to be able to answer the question, if I started with X and Y concentrations of my reagents, how fast can I expect the reaction to go? Okay, take a look at rate laws, the differential rate law, in more detail. The first thing we need to make sure we appreciate is that rate laws, the differential rate law, can only be found experimentally. If you don't have data, you cannot figure out the differential rate law. There's no way to theoretically come up with a differential rate law. Well, I, I suppose that's not true. I suppose you could theoretically come up with the rate law, but the only way to make sure that it's correct, that it actually describes the real system, is to go ahead and do the data collection. So let's take a close look at an example here. We're going to look at the decomposition of nitrogen dioxide to form nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas. What we want to do is we want to be able to describe the rate of this reaction in terms of this reagent, NO2. Why do we limit ourselves to reagents? Well, think about this from an experimentalist standpoint. The only thing you and I can control as the experimentalist when we do a chemical reaction, there's really two things we can control. We can control the amount of reagent we start with, the concentration, and we can control the temperature. So if I'm to express how fast a reaction can go, I only want to express it in terms of those things I can control, specifically the concentration of the reactant. So, whenever you derive a differential rate law, the first thing you have to do is write down what's referred to as the general rate law. All general rate laws will have the same general format. They all start with the word rate, then there's an equal sign, then we have the letter K, which I'll get to in a second, and then that is multiplied by the concentration of each and every reactant raised to some unknown power. So that letter K is the rate constant. In a way, it's sort of to uh, rate constants are to kinetics what equilibrium constants are to thermodynamics. A rate constant sort of dictates how fast a reaction can go, whereas an equilibrium constant dictates where the reaction eventually is going to go. And then the order is something that modifies each reagent. Each individual reagent will have its own order. In this particular example, there's only one reactant, one reagent, so there's only one order, namely, as I showed it here, N. So what order will do is it'll describe how the rate of the reaction is, um, is predicated on that reagent's concentration. So if I were to double a reactant's concentration, how would the rate respond? If I were to cut it in half, if I were to raise it by a factor of 10, the order will help me determine how the reaction rate will respond. So when I ask you to derive the differential rate law for a reaction, what you have to ultimately determine for me is the value of N for each reagent and a value for K 
for the overall reaction. Okay, so let's take a look at some actual data for a real reaction. Here I'm showing the decomposition of dinitrogen pentoxide to nitrogen dioxide and oxygen gas. And as you can see, the reaction is already balanced. On a side note, the way a reaction is balanced is not going to have a lot to do with the orders that we determine as we derive the differential rate law. So don't think that this two means much in terms of what we're deriving right now. Okay, so step one, I write down the general rate law. And as I said on the previous slide, all rate laws start with the same thing. We have the word rate, an equal sign, the letter K, and then the concentration of each reagent, in this case I only have one, raised to some unknown order. Okay, and I'll just keep using the letter N. Our mission, if we choose to accept it, and well, you're watching the video, so you have to accept it, again, is to find the value of N and to find the value of K. Below here, we see what it looks like when we collect kinetic data, when we get our um, ever so helpful graduate students to go into the lab and find data for us. You'll see here that we've run two experimental trials, experiment number one and experiment number two, and these are completely different experiments. So the reaction was done with 0.9 molar N205, and it was monitored for a while. And then the reaction was taken down and was set up a second time, starting with 0.45 molar dinitrogen pentoxide. And the kind of data we collect is we collect what's referred to as initial rate information, initial rate data. And you see there that initial rate has the units of molar per second. Sometimes you'll see it in molar per minute, maybe it's in um, atmospheres per hour. It all depends upon exactly what kind of a reaction you're running, but it's usually going to be some measure of concentration or pressure divided by some time unit. Okay, In this case, again, molar per second. And I use the phrase here, initial rate. What we're doing is we're monitoring how the reaction proceeds over the first few moments of the reaction. So if I were to graph, say, concentration versus time, we know that for a reagent, the concentration is going to go down over some period of time. And what I'm doing here is I might be monitoring, oh, say, the first, I don't know, maybe five or ten minutes of the reaction. That's why we refer to it as an initial rate. Okay? So our graduate student has collected data here. And in experiment one, if we were to start with 0.9 molar dinitrogen pentoxide, we have an initial rate of 5.4 times 10 to the minus 4 molar per second. So every second, 5.4 times 10 to the minus 4 moles per liter of N205 is used. In the second version of the experiment, starting at 0.45, we get an initial rate of 2.7 times 10 to the 4. Now, if you're looking closely at the numbers, you see that I have very specific ratios here that I'm using. Again, I set this up. This is what I have control over, the initial concentration of dinitrogen pentoxide. That's what the little zero means, right, initial concentration. The initial rate, I can't control. Mother Nature controls that, but at least I can get the data for that. So now using this table of data that I've got here, I'm going to be able to find the value of N and eventually I'll be able to find the value of K. Let's take a look and see how we do this. I can pick either set of data. I can pick the data from experiment one or the data from experiment two and plug it into my solving for K. So I'm going to go through this in some gory detail here for this example, just so you get the problem-solving algorithm. The math here I don't think is challenging. It's just setting up a whole series of ratios. So what we do is we're going to compare the initial rates between the two experiments. So I've taken experiment one to experiment two, and I'm going to set up a ratio between the rate from the first experiment to the rate of the second experiment. And then I just rewrite the rate law for both experiments. So that would be the rate constant K times the concentration of dinitrogen pentoxide to the N for the first experiment. Then I put below that the rest of the ratio by writing the rate law a second time for what will eventually be the second set of data. So now I plug in my numbers. The rate I observed in the first experiment was 5.4 times 10 to the minus 4. 
the rate I observed in the second experiment was 2.7 to the minus 4. Then I equate that to the general rate law, except now I'm going to start putting in some numbers. I have the rate constant k times 0 0.90 was the initial concentration I used in experiment 1 raised to the n, divided by that rate constant times 0.45 molar raised to the same n. Now I don't know yet what n is, but I know that order is particular to a particular reagent in a particular reaction. N doesn't change. It is a property of that re reaction. Same thing for K. K doesn't change. That's why we call it the rate constant. The only thing that's going to make K change is a change in temperature, and we'll see that later on. So now I've got myself a ratio. The cool thing is stuff cancels out. I don't know what the rate constant is, but whatever it is, I can factor it out of this ratio right now. So now my rates have a ratio of 2, and my concentrations have a ratio of 2 to the n. So I don't need to know much math to know that n in this case is going to be equal to 1. So now my rate law is rate equals k times the concentration of N2O5 to the first. So this reaction would be said to be first order with respect to the N2O5, okay, first order. We're going to talk about other orders later on in the course, but right now when you see a superscript of 1 modifying a concentration, know that that means that the lingo is first order. All right, so that takes care of that N thing. Now I need to solve for K. Well, this is just going to be some more algebra. I now can solve for K. K will be equal to rate divided by the concentration of N2O5 to the first. And I can then go back to the previous. So I could plug in the rate from experiment one here, the concentration from experiment one there, do the ratio, do the calculation, and I will get my value of k. Now one thing I want to comment here is on the units of k. I know that rate is molar per second, and I know that concentration here was molar and it's going to be molar to the first because I have a first order reaction. Notice that the molars will cancel out and for a first order reaction the units of K are 1 over seconds or to put it more generally 1 over time. If I had a different order, say I had a second order reaction, the units for K there would be 1 over concentration seconds. And if you just do the dimensional analysis, you see how that works. Uh, take it up a notch, and let's look at a reaction that involves multiple reagents. So here I've got the reaction of ammonium cation with uh, an anion of nitrogen dioxide to form nitrogen gas and some water. And so our trusty graduate students have gone into the lab once again for us, and they've now done three trials of experimental data and they've modified the initial concentrations of the ammonium cation and nitrogen dioxide anion between each experimental trial and then they've recorded the rates. So again, this is the stuff you set up. This is the data you collect during the course of the experiment. So now what I need to do is I gotta set up my general rate law and then I've gotta figure out how I'm gonna solve for the exponents. So my general rate law I write down the word rate, an equal sign. I have a rate constant for the reaction times the concentration of each reagent, NH4 plus, times the concentration of NO2 minus. And then each of these will then be modified by some unknown exponent. Let's use maybe the letter N for NH4 plus and the letter M for the NO2 minus. So that's my general differential rate law. I've written the rate law in terms of concentration of reactants, a rate constant, and orders for each of the reactants. Notice everything is multiplied through. There are no plus signs here. Everything's multiplied through. Okay, so now let's look at the ratios to go ahead and get our values of um, N and L. So there's my general rate law at the top. I'm going to take the ratio of experiment 2 to experiment 1. 
So that'll be the second rate divided by the first rate, and then the general rate law for the second experiment versus the general rate law for the first experiment. So now I plug in my numbers. My rate from experiment 2 is 2.7 to the minus 7. My rate from experiment 1 was 1.35 times 10 to the minus 7. Now I plug in my initial concentrations. The NH4 plus concentration in experiment 2 was 0.1. The NO2 minus concentration in experiment 2 was 0.01. Then NH4 plus and NO2 minus for experiment 1 was 0.1 and 0.005. Again, some helpful things happen. The Ks are going to factor out. I don't know what the right constant is, but I know it's a constant, so it's going to factor out. Additionally here, based on the clever way that our graduate students set up the initial concentrations, the NH4 plus concentrations also factor out. So while I don't know what N is, it factors out of this ratio, so I can isolate my value of M. So I have a ratio of 2 in the, in the uh, experimental rates, and I have a ratio of 2 for the concentrations to the M, so it turns out that the order of the reaction with respect to the NO2 minus is going to be 1. Then, to find the value of N, I'm going to use a different set of experimental trials to find N. In this case, I'm going to take experiment 3 to experiment 2, plug in all the appropriate data for those two experimental trials, once again, I see a ratio of 2 for the rates, a ratio of 2 for the concentrations, and a value of 1 for the order. Now, perhaps this isn't the best uh, couple of examples I've shown you because the order keeps coming out to being 1. I promise you it's not always going to be that straightforward. So then now I have my specific rate law for this reaction involving NH4 plus and NO2 minus. Listen to the lingo here for a second. The rate is K times NH4 plus to the first NO2 minus to the first. So the reaction is first order with respect to NH4 plus, first order with respect to NO2 minus, but overall it's second order overall. How did I get second? Well, hopefully you've got this figured out. I just added the two orders together to get second order overall. Now you should take some time to go ahead and solve for k. right? You can algebraically now solve for k. k will be equal to the rate divided by the concentration of NH4 plus times the concentration of NO2 minus. And to solve for k, pick any of the three trials. You can pick the first experiment, the second experiment, or the third experiment, and plug in the appropriate numbers. Since it's a constant, you should get darn close to the same answer. Our numbers here in these problems are idealized, so you will get the same numbers, but real experimental data will obviously have some error associated with it, but to a very small degree of error, you should get the same value of k. More importantly, this is a second order reaction overall. What are the units of the rate constant? Well, rate is molar per second, and then I have molar times molar in the denominator. One of these molars factor out, so my units would be 1 over molar second. Notice that the units of K, as I alluded to before, the units of K will vary depending upon the overall order of the reaction. Okay, when we come back into class, we'll probably start by me asking you to solve for a general rate law for another reaction, for another example. So make sure you can do this ratio problem solving algorithm and do the necessary algebra to solve for K and the necessary unit analysis to solve for the um, units of the rate constant as well. That'll do it for now.